I want to welcome you all to our March Hawkeye Lunch and Learn today and um, want to remind you that this is a part of our 2017 theme semester where we're focused on the internet and technology. And um, if you want to know more about a variety of events that are going on for our theme semester, please do stop at the table as you're leaving today, which is just to the back. And it's uh, my pleasure today to introduce to you Dr. Zubair Sharif and Shafiq, I'm sorry, mispronounced his name. Um, he's here to speak to us today about big data. And uh, that's a very important topic on our university today because we actually have an entire unit in my College of Public Health on the fifth floor um, devoted to that entire topic of, of in informatics. So we're very happy that he's here today. Um, he is an assistant professor in computer science at the University of Iowa. And he um, has done a great deal to look at the coordination of informatics across our campus. He graduated from the University of Michigan for his PhD a very short time ago, 2014. And his current research involves conducting large-scale measurements uh, to study security, privacy, and performance aspects of the internet, a very important topic today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Shafiq. Thank you for the introduction, Linda, and thank you all for coming for this talk. The title of this talk is Big Data, Big Brother. So hopefully most of you have heard about big data and how it has the potential to revolutionize our lives. The key idea behind big data is to collect combine, analyze data from heterogeneous sources, to mine insights, um, and to drive efficiencies in our business systems. So this is going to be big as we go on over the next decade. In this talk, I would highlight the dark side of big data, how big data can be exploited to undermine our privacy. This talk is about how private companies collect data about us when we browse the internet use it to infer our behaviors, our preferences, and then how they monetize these inferred behaviors and preferences. And then in the second part of my talk, I will talk about how Big Brother piggies back on this information which is collected by private companies. And governments use this information to do surveillance on their citizens. So before we go and talk about most of these things, let me give you a quick background about what happens when you try to browse any website on the internet. So let's say you open your favorite browser. Um, next week is spring break. Maybe you're trying to book a hotel um, for your spring break. So you go to hotels.com um, and you press enter. Now if you peek um, in the, behind the browser and try to figure out what actually is going on in the background, so this is your laptop, for example, and you're trying to connect to hotels.com server. Your browser will send out a request to hotels.com server to download the web page um, for their home page. Um, so this request is called an HTTP request. HTTP is always included in the URL that you type in your web browser. HTTP is really just the standard language which is spoken by web browsers and web servers. Hotels.com server receives this request from your web browser, and then it responds back with an HTML file. So this is really a text file which contains a bunch of resources that need to be subsequently requested by your browser to show you the full web page. So this initial HTML text file will contain references to images, to videos, and a bunch of other information that is necessary to show you the whole um, web page on Hotels.com. So after downloading this initial HTML file, your browser issues multiple subsequent requests to download images, videos, style files, and a bunch of other script files from hotels.com server. At least that is what most people think actually happens in the background. But you, if look a little more deeper, what you find out is your browser not only sends requests to hotels.com server, it is actually sending out requests to other 
websites like comscore.com and doubleclick.com. Most people have not heard of these names. In fact, your browser connects to more than 50 servers when you 50 servers others than, other than hotels.com when you try to go to and hotels.com and open their web page these domains like comscore and doubleclick they are called third party domains because these are not the domains you intended to visit when you type this in in your web browser these third party domains they are typically called trackers or data brokers that these companies are primarily in the business of collecting information about you as you go from one website to another on the internet. And as the name suggests, so this is what their business model is. So I will call them third party trackers for the rest of my talk. So if there is a third party tracker, which is on multiple websites, they would precisely know as you go from one website to the other. So let's say first you go to hotels.com and then you go to ebay.com and comscore.com is present on both of these websites. Comscore would know that you first went to hotels.com and then you went to ebay.com. And sometimes you can actually figure this out. When you go to ebay.com, you might see an ad which would remind you to complete your hotel purchase on ebay.com. So this is very common. So this is exactly how this is done using these third party trackers. So let me give you a little more technical uh, information about how these third party trackers track you across different websites. So to track you across different websites, they need to assign you unique identifiers. So think of these as social security numbers. So every person is assigned a unique number. So this is the way they also want to track you. So they know precisely that's you that who is going from one website to another. So they can use one thing that most of you hopefully have heard about, it's called IP addresses to track you across different websites, but that is actually not a good um, information to uniquely identify people. Because let's say you have a laptop and you go from a coffee shop to campus, your IP address would change. So because IP address is going to change, IP addresses are not good unique identifiers, although they are still like very powerful in narrowing down who was accessing a particular website. So there are two techniques that they use to uniquely identify users. The first one, which is commonly used, it's called cookies. These are not the sweet cookies that you just had. Um, these are, cookies actually are um, strings. So these are random numbers, um, which are, which these websites ask your browsers to store on your local machine. So when you go to hotels.com, Comscore will ask your browser to store a unique cookie, which is just a unique long string, which actually does not make much sense. Um, and your browser stores it. And whenever you go to other websites um, and Comscore is on those websites, your browser will automatically append this cookie um, to comscore.com. So Comscore will know this is the person that originally visited hotels.com and is going to multiple other websites. Um, so some of you who are more computer savvy, they would know that cookies can be bad because they can be used to track you. So in your browser, you have an option to delete cookies or not allow certain websites to store cookies in your browser. So users actually have some control over whether they want to restrict cookies um, from different websites. So some of these third party trackers have started to use this new technology, which is called fingerprinting. So fingerprinting uh, does not require any cooperation from browsers. So fingerprinting relies on the fact that every workstation is unique. So you have unique software, you have some unique hardware variation on every workstation. So, so they ask every browser to do a standardized task. Let's say they want them to draw a circle, but because every workstation has different software hardware configurations, every workstation does the task in a slightly different way. And because everyone is doing this task in a slightly different way, this information about how the circle was exactly drawn can be used as a unique identifier for people. Now the key point here is most people actually don't know how this fingerprinting work. And if you visit a website, there is no way for you to figure out a website is involved in fingerprinting. And these fingerprinting based unique identifiers are very powerful. They actually can be much more accurate than cookies and more stable than cookies because users actually don't have any control of changing their fingerprint unless you change the software or hardware on your machine. So they are very powerful ways of tracking users across different websites. So 
let's talk about how many trackers are there. So if you go to a typical website, are there like maybe a few trackers? Are there dozens of trackers? So what's the situation? So it turns out these trackers are very common on news websites. So if you go to, for example, foxnews.com or newyorktimes.com, you will be tracked by dozens of third-party <laughs> trackers. So they are plentiful and they are everywhere. And news websites, uh, probably okay. Some people might think, okay, they will figure out what kind of news I am reading. That's probably not too bad. But they are on some websites that you really start to think about, do they actually have any business of being there? So for example, if you go to webmd.com, which is a website a lot of people go to to look up for symptoms, for example. Um, so there are about 17 trackers, 17 different companies tracking your information that you visited webmd.com. And let's say if you were searching for some symptoms of cancer or you had a lump and you were just trying to look up your um, effects, um, so, so these 17 companies would know that you were actually doing that. So this is hopefully starting to sound scary a little bit. <laughs> Healthcare.gov. So probably won't be here too long, um, but if you had a chance to go to healthcare.gov to sign up for health insurance, you would be surprised that there are six trackers tracking you. So there are six private companies which know which person is tr trying to sign up for healthcare. So again, this is very odd. If you go to uiwa.edu, surprise, surprise, there are seven companies which are tracking you. And I looked up actually um, this week, so there are companies like DoubleClick, Facebook, Twitter. So University of Iowa probably advertises um, to people when they want to, let's say, advertise some programs or a lecture like this. But not, so obviously university is able to advertise, but then Google and Facebook and Twitter, they also get all this information. And then they can use this information with other information that they have then to profile people. And I will talk more about this in a little bit. But just to give you a quick sense of what are some of the big trackers on the internet. So on this graph on x-axis, these are the big third-party tracking companies on the internet. On y-axis is what percentage of the internet they cover. So it's very um, alarming to know that Google can actually track you across more than 80% of top 1 million websites. So if you go to any of these websites, there's a high likelihood that Google is tracking you on those websites. So they can, so these top trackers, they can get a very precise picture of um, like which websites you are visiting um, over time. And there's also a very long tail of other trackers. They don't cover big swaths of the internet, but they actually uh, combine this data from each other. So they um, cooperate with each other, they exchange information, and by doing this information sharing, they are able to actually get a much clearer picture of users. So it's not just the big trackers we have to worry about. The small trackers actually are also very powerful. They can also know a lot about your behavior as you browse the internet. Okay. Now, let's ask a basic question. Why are they tracking you? Right? So, um, and why are they everywhere? So let's try to get a sense of why tracking happens on the internet. And this is what I call corporate surveillance capitalism. So the most of the internet, most of the websites that we visit, they are free. So how do you think they actually make money? They make money off of advertising. That's the business they are in. At surface, advertising might seem like very simple, very innocuous, but let's roll back a little bit and get a historical perspective of how advertising has evolved, and it will give us more sense of why advertising is very um, intricately um, intertwined with tracking on the internet. So back in the day, good old newspapers, we used to have these things. Um, publishers wrote what they wanted, and they left these empty rectangles on newspapers. So advertisers could buy these rectangles and they could um, decide what to put in these rectangles. Um, viewers would occasionally look at these rectangles when you were reading a newspaper. Maybe you liked something, you decided to buy something. So that's how the advertising business worked back in the day. Life was very simple. And then there were these ad agencies that you would recruit to figure out what you want to actually put in this ad. And there was a lot of effort that was put in into designing very nice looking ads, which really conveyed the message that you wanted to um, send uh, to the public. And this was primitive form of advertising. Um, there was a big problem in this. 
that the big problem in primitive form of this print advertising was that half of the money that you spent was wasted. And the big problem was that you did not know which half was wasted. So it, there was no way for advertisers to figure out how effective their advertising was. Okay? And so just to again recap, so we really have a simple trinity of three entities. So we have advertisers who, dis, who put their ads on publisher, publishers like newspapers, and on the other side we have viewers who buy these newspapers and look at these ads. So this is like a very simple architecture of advertising. And advertising in newspapers was actually a huge industry. It was a multi-billion dollar industry. And this peaked roughly around in 2000. There was $67 billion advertising revenue for print advertising in newspapers, primarily. And then something happened. The revenue started to go down at a very fast pace. So what happened really was companies like Google and Facebook emerged. And these companies were in the business of advertising. So in 2001, Google bought DoubleClick, which is the online advertising exchange, um, to show their ads, to, to show ads on their search engine. And then obviously very um, quickly, Facebook also um, followed suit, and then advertisers could also put ads on Facebook. And in the last few years, Google's advertising revenue, annual, annual advertising revenue has exceeded $70 billion. And whereas that of newspaper advertising has gone really down. So this is like the change that has happened in the last um, couple of decades. Online advertising, you don't have those nice advertisings anymore. Now you have these uh, annoying flashy ads that you see, um, that you see on all websites. Um, this has made advertising very cheap actually. So if you are actually a very small um, business, you can advertise relatively cheaply and you can reach out a large number of people. Um, so that's like really the big benefit of online advertising. But other than this big benefit for advertisers, there were three big promises of online advertising. The first one was that for the first time, an advertiser could actually tell how many clicks happened on their advertisements. So you can actually tell how effective was your ad, how many people actually clicked on something, and they maybe went on to buy something. The second big advantage was that you can target these ads. So not only you can target your ads on specific websites, on a website, and so the decision to show a person a specific ad is made in real time. So based on what kind of information they have on you, they might decide to show you different ads. So let's say if you go to New York Times, New York talk, uh, nytimes.com, and they think that you are conscious about your weight, they will in real time figure this out and show you an ad to lose weight. If they know that you are, in, you are planning to buy a new cell phone, they will show you an ad for that purpose. So this is very precisely targeted now. And the third big advantage of this whole thing was this ecosystem became much more complex. Now, in the middle of this ecosystem, we have a bunch of companies which are called ad exchanges. So a publisher actually does not have to worry about um, buying ads, um, buying, uh, of, of selling out their ad spaces to different advertisers. Ad exchanges would do this for them. So if you have a website, you don't have to worry about contacting Nike to figure out whether they want to advertise on your websites. Companies like DoubleClick, which is the ad exchange owned by Google, will do that for you. So this actually was huge, and obviously, companies started to make a lot of money. Everybody was making more money. Everyone looked on this and they were very happy until this happened. So there was a big problem on the internet in 2000s. There was this problem that advertising companies were facing. It was called click fraud. So if someone clicks on your ad, you cannot actually tell whether they were humans or they were bots. So there were spammers and hackers who would actually make bogus websites and they would ask Google to put ads on their websites. And then they would actually write computer programs to click on those ads. So as those programs click on ads, people would make money. And this actually was a huge business and still actually is to some extent a huge business in many developing countries. Um, so companies wrote some programs to try to eliminate this click fraud. So they figured out like what are bots and how can we separate them from real users. But then these spammers and hackers, they stepped up their game. 
they actually hired actual people in developing countries who would wake up, they would go to a computer center, and they would open a bunch of websites, and they would start clicking. So then these were real people. So it was very hard to distinguish between um, these people and actual people who were clicking on your ads. So, so really, the big challenge for advertisers and publishers was how to figure out if these clicks were real. And the response was this. So they simply increased the complexity of this ecosystem. So the key idea was that if we can collect more data about people, we can actually even try to figure out whether this person is actually part of a click farm. So the idea was if we get more information, we can use that information to more accurately distinguish between real people and fake people. So this prompted data wars between different companies, all these companies now which we have in the simple trinity of advertising. And all these companies are in the business of collecting information on consumers. They sell this information to advertisers, to ad exchanges, to drive up efficiency. So the goal of all this data tracking is to reduce click fraud and to do more precise targeted advertising. Google was the big player initially in the online advertising ecosystem. Um, um, they had a bunch of data from their search engine um, and their email client, Gmail. Then Facebook came along, and Facebook obviously started getting really popular. Now more than 1.5 billion people around the world use Facebook. And all these companies in this ecosystem, including publishers, they started to collaborate with each other. So all this data is being shared with each other. And, we, and these companies are building more and more accurate profiles of people. What do they do? What are they interested in? And now the situation is vastly different. So this is a redo of the famous New Yorker article where now these companies actually precisely know who you are. They know that if you are a dog, they can actually figure that out. It's not really a big deal. So let me give you a quick example of one of the companies which is in this tracking business. And this company, hopefully most of you have heard about, its name is Experian. They are in the credit business as well. And they combine information from multiple offline and online sources. They also are in the tracking business, so they do track you across the internet. And the information I'm about to show you is from their public brochures. And they kind of like uh, brag about what kind of information they have on people in the United States in this particular example. So they know a lot about us. So they claim to have information about 299 million people in the United States alone. Um, more than 100 million households. And they claim to have hundreds of data points on every person. So they know information like our age, our education, our gender, our income, our occupation, and whether we have kids, right? And then if you really dig deeper, they also know a lot. So US is a country of immigrants, right? So they know what is your ethnicity. They know your country of origin. They know if you speak a particular language. And all this information is available to us. And you can only imagine how this information can be misused in certain contexts. And I will give you some more examples later. One interesting thing that they do is they divide all of us into different segments. So every person is usually part of hundreds of different segments. And this is one segment that they actually advertise. So it turns out a lot of spending is driven by moms in our homes. So they actually have multiple categories for moms. There are soccer moms. There are couponing moms. There are moms with one kids. There are moms which are more laid back, which are more outdoorsy. So again, all this information is um, collected for us. And one of the things I want to point out here is you actually don't know whether this segmentation is accurate. Sometimes they can identify you as part of a segment and that might be inaccurate, but there is no way for you to actually tell them, hey, you have categorized me incorrectly. So you might be seeing some nasty ads on the internet, and that might just be their algorithm working um, incorrectly. And there is no way to actually figure out how much they know about us and what kind of segments they have actually divided us into. They know our little secrets. They know very small details about us. For example, they know if you like to indulge in fast food. This is very easy for them to figure out. They know whether you play lotteries or whether you have a certain type of insurance or they know whether you are conscious about your weight. Okay, so this is really powerful stuff. So it's hard to imagine there are thousands of companies out there who know all this information about everyone in the US and also around the world. So we don't know what they know and 
we don't have any control over this information, right? So let me first give you some horror stories that have actually happened. So what could possibly go wrong? Yep. I'm sorry. Could you tell me the company that you were talking about? Experian. E x p e r i e n. So I can spend the whole day talking about some of the horror stories that have happened. But I would like to highlight some of the big ones, um, which I think have broader impacts other than like exactly just what just happened. And obviously are more um, relevant in the current context. So the first one. So collecting information about ethnicity, about country of origin, about language, languages people speak is not itself actually illegal or even unethical. But if you use this information in specific context, it's actually unlawful. So for example, in the US, we have a Fair Housing Act. So you cannot discriminate between people on the basis of their race, of their country of origin, or the languages they speak. Um, so Facebook was actually letting advertisers who were advertising for different um, pr um, properties to rent out on the basis of their race or their ethnicities. And this turns out was actually illegal under this Fair Housing Act that we have in the US. Um, then obviously Facebook thankfully pulled off this information from advertisers, so now they do actually scan and make sure that certain types of ads are not being targeted. Or another way to think about targeting is discrimination. So you cannot discriminate across people when you're trying to advertise for some of these um, kind of things which are protected by the Constitution. So other thing is credit agencies. So if you are advertising for credit, so we have this Consumer Credit Protection Act, which bars companies from discriminating based again on race, sexual orientation, um, ethnicity, and so on. So advertise, so right now in the online advertising industry, this is just one example for Facebook, but no one knows what else is going on in other types of online advertising. And advertisers are allowed to target or discriminate against people on the basis of these protected classes like race, religion, sexual orientation, and ethnicities, and so on. So this is really bad. And another example I would like to point out is, um, um, so there has been some talks recently about creating a registry of all Muslims in the United States. And some people think, actually, this would be very hard for the government to do, because the government agencies have to go out, they have to collect this information, they have to compile this information. Maybe you have to, next time in the US census, it will be unprecedented talk, ask people about their religion, which actually has not happened in a long time. But the important thing to note here is the government actually does not have to collect any information. This information is already out there. Recently, there have been a lot of hate crimes against minority. There have been hate crimes against Jews, against Muslims, recently against people from India, against Sikhs, um, very recently as well. Um, and all this data about different religious minorities in the US is actually available from many third-party data brokers. So Amnesty International recently did, did a sting operation where they actually contacted one of the companies called exactdata.com. You can go to their website, actually. This is right up there. All of you can go and do this right now. Um, and you can go and you can actually select um, different categories. And within four to five clicks, you can get a quote of what would it take to get information about all Muslims in the United States. Turns out you can buy this information. And in this information will contain hundreds of data points about every Muslim, including their location, what kind of business they are in, and again, other things that I've talked about for less than $150,000. And for example, for smaller minorities, this information is much cheaper. So you can get the list of all six in the United States for less than $15,000. So this is really scary. And it's not hard to imagine other potential applications of this. So Amnesty International contacted a bunch of companies who were third party trackers to give them information about all undocumented immigrants in California. And several companies had this information and they were willing to share this information. And they were very confident about the accuracy of their information. Um, using this kind of information, the government can also try to maintain a registry of all people who own guns in the United States. And some people think that is against the second amendment that we have in the US Constitution. Right? So, so there's serious implication of private companies having this information and when this kind of information is not regulated. And very recently, in the 2016 presidential election, um, this technology was also used to do micro-targeted election campaigning. So, so the, this was actually not 
new. Obama campaign used this in 2012. But most recently, this is a picture of a company called Cambridge Analytica. They are based in UK. And they were working with the Cruz campaign and the Trump campaign to do targeted advertising on people. So, so the key idea of micro-targeting election campaigns based on the data which these companies have is that you actually send out a different version of a message to different people. And you can think that this is actually very bad for our democracy because people are hearing different things. So they cannot agree on the facts. So this, can really, this really has the potential to divide our society and make everything more polarized. So what these uh, micro-targeting election campaigns, companies like Cambridge Analytica claim to do is that we are going to drive up efficiencies. So you're going to be spending less dollars on advertising and you will be reaching more consumers. And in the picture which is shown in the background, this company has information about all voters in Iowa. So this is the map of Iowa and they precisely have the location of all Democratic and Republican voters. And again, you can target a specific message for people who are Democrats, but they feel strongly about gun ownership, for example. So you can slice and dice people into different segments and show them different messages, right? So as I pointed out, this is bad for our democracy because people would like to have a candidate say the same thing to everyone all the time, right? So this is only going to make our democracy more contentious, more polarized. Okay, and this kind of technology is not only used in the US, it has been used in referendums in the UK, and this kind of technology will be used going forward as well. And with almost unlimited money flowing into our elections, again, you can only imagine what other possible applications could be. So in the second part of my talk, I would like to switch gears and focus more on the governments. So not on private companies, but how governments actually piggyback on this data which is collected by companies to spy on their citizens. So in the US, the Fourth Amendment actually at a high level defines the basic right to privacy. So it means that government cannot spy on their citizens without a court order. So unless they have due suspicion that someone has done something wrong. Fourth Amendment was ratified in 1792. Again, this was back in the day, modern forms of communication were not prevalent at that point in time. So it's very hard to take the Fourth Amendment and try to apply it to internet systems. So after the Watergate scandal in 1978, a new act was passed, which was called FISA Act, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. And this was the first act which actually tried to translate some of the protections which were in Fourth Amendment and apply it to modern communication technologies like telephone companies and the internet. And the key provision in this new FISA Act was that the government cannot do surveillance on their citizens without an explicit court order. And if there was a reason that court order had to remain anonymous or that order has to remain secret, there were secret FISA courts. So the barrier for the government was low, but still you had to go in front of a judge and ask for a court order. However, after 9-11, um, a new act was passed, which was called the Patriot Act. And the Patriot Act significantly reduced the burden on the governments to go to the court and ask for these court orders. And under the Patriot Act, the NSA, the National Security Agency, secretly started a bulk data collection program where they were collecting telephone and internet data about citizens in the US and also citizens abroad. And this program was borderline unconstitutional. And there were many people inside the NSA who were concerned about the legality of this program. Under this program, the government could actually ask internet companies and telephone companies to provide them this information. Um, and the key thing that was enabled by the Patriot Act was these companies were required by law not to disclose this information publicly. So they had these so-called gag orders which stopped these companies from disclosing that they were actually providing information to the government. All of this was done in secret until this happened. So in 2013, Ed Snowden, who was hired by the NSA as a contractor, um, leaked classified information which actually revealed the magnitude of the surveillance which was going on. So he revealed thousands of classified documents to reputed journalists who later on did a lot of investigation on this. But the immediate response from the government was that we are not looking at your conversations, we are not reading your emails, we are not um, listening to your phone calls. 
We are only collecting metadata. And as we've just discussed, cookies are metadata. Fingerprints are metadata. So they don't have to read your emails to precisely know what you are doing. So if you combine metadata from multiple sources, all of this can be combined to have a very powerful picture of what people are doing. So some of the revelations, so this was a big one. So this was the infamous PRISM program. Under this program, the government, NSA was, had direct access to major internet companies going as far back as 2007. So they had Microsoft, and then later on they had Google and Facebook, and more recently Apple as well. And when this was leaked out in 2013, there was a lot of public backlash for these internet companies. And the companies actually started to fight back um, for the government. And the companies tried to add protect protection, and they wanted to make sure this consumer data is protected. Because if there is a public perception that the US government gets everything that you upload on Facebook, people will stop using Facebook. So there was some resistance after these public revelations. Um, but there were other programs. So this was another program called Muscular. Under this program, the NSA was tapping on to the big internet cables which were going across continents. So these undersea cables and other cables, they see a majority of the internet traffic that flows on the internet. So the NSA, again, this did not require any cooperation from internet companies, was collecting all this data from these undersea cable, underground internet cables and they would simply get all the information that they needed from this kind of program. So these taps, and you can see them on the map, were located primarily outside the US, so they did not have to follow the US Constitution to some extent. And then very recently, two years after Ed Snowden's revelations, there were finally some change. A new regulation was passed, which was a new law was passed, which was called the USA Freedom Act, which again tried to restore some of the constraints that the government had to actually have to do surveillance on people. So this has slowed down, but this has not completely stopped. And while there is resistance to this kind of surveillance in the US, there is very little resistance in many other, com other countries which are not as democratic as the US. So for example, Chinese government is actually planning to launch a very ambitious project where they're planning to assign a social credit score to every citizen. So China already has a very strong and very comprehensive censorship program. So they monitor all the traffic which goes in and out of China. So th this is called the Great Firewall of China. And the goal is to use that information to then assign citizens credit score, something like a social credit score. So for example, um, if you are involved in some unwanted activities, your score would go down. And the implications could be your kids would not be allowed to go to particular school. You would not be allowed to stay at a particular set of hotels and so on. So again, this thing, this kind of government surveillance based on this data which is collected by internet companies can be very powerful, can have really negative repercussions in other countries. So this is what I call a ideal marriage between corporate and government surveillance. The government actually does not have to do anything. The NSA and CIA, they probably love Google and Facebook because people are voluntarily uploading all this information about minor details of their lives, so they don't have to expand any resources to collect this information themselves. And the broader sentiment in the intelligence community is that if people are okay with giving up this information to Facebook and Google so that you can use these services for free, then people probably are okay with giving up this information to shore up national security to stop terrorist attacks um, in the country. So this kind of mindset really undermines our privacy and this kind of logic can be extended and then the government would be looking at all actions of their citizens. So this can be really bad. So the broader question here is, do people really care about our privacy? Do people like us? Do people who live in the US, they care about their privacy? And turns out they do. So there was this survey done by Pew Research where more than 90% of people said that they really care about what kind of information is collected about them and who is collecting this information. However, more than 90% of people also said that there is actually a feeling of giving up. They have no idea how to control this information. So there have been, so people, companies and regulators know that people do care about their privacy, but there is really not much that it seems on the surface that you can do as a common citizen. So let's look at how we can try to do 
try to change some of this. So obviously you can be involved in activism. So this is a picture um, of a balloon which was um, flown out by Greenpeace and the Electronic Frontier Foundation. This, is, this was done on 4th of July after Snowden regulations. And the, the balloon actually was saying illegal spying below and this was flown above an NSA data center in Utah, which was collecting information and storing information about US citizens. So again, I would encourage all of you to become part of these organizations and next time when you try to think about donating some of your money, do consider organizations like Electronic Frontier Foundation, ACLU, and Amnesty International. Other than this, how can we bring change? Obviously, we can pass new laws. We have the new Congress. So do we have any hope of actually passing new regulations to protect our privacy? And there are some government agencies like the Federal Trade Commission, Federal Communications Commissions, which control and regulate some of these internet companies. So I will talk some of a bit about that, and I will also briefly talk about some of the technical countermeasures you can do as an individual user to protect your privacy. So there was, in 2009, um, after Google was really getting really big and Facebook also went mainstream, there was a push from the Federal Trade Commission asking online advertisers and companies to self-regulate. These companies were making billions of dollars. They were creating thousands of jobs. So government was really reluctant to regulate these companies. So these companies in 2011 came up with this program called Ad Choices. So now whenever you see an ad on the internet, you have this blue thing on the top right and you can click here and you, the companies would actually tell you why you are seeing a particular ad. But again, this kind of program does not give you any option to opt out of tracking. You cannot stop these companies from collecting information about you. There was this other program called Do Not Track, which was supposed to be a voluntary program. So if you have this Do Not Track setting enabled in your web browsers, companies would voluntarily not track you. Again, this is too good to be true. Nothing came off of it. And then finally, the FCC was one of the agencies which right, after, right before the new administrations passed some regulations called broadband privacy regulations, which stopped internet service providers like Mediacom and CenturyLink to collect information about their consumers and sell it to make profit off of advertising. And last week, actually, the new FCC commissioner actually rolled back all of these regulations. So the, my point is there is very little hope that any regulation or government agencies would do something, at least in the near future, to prioritize your privacy over the profits these companies are making. So as a consumer, you really only have one option. And when you use a web browser, you should be using privacy-enhancing tools. And these are very easy to install. So the one of the popular tools is called Privacy Badger, which was developed by Electronic Frontier Foundation. There was another tool called Ghostry, what these tools do is as you go to different websites, they block all the third party trackers that are on these websites. So companies cannot collect this information. And then there are tools like ad blockers. These tools go way ahead. They, said, they say that, okay, there are all these trackers, but why are they tracking you everywhere? They want to show you ads. So how about we get rid of ads as well as trackers? So that's exactly what they do. So if you install an ad blocker, most of the ad blockers are open source. They use publicly available lists so you exactly know what kind of things they are blocking. You can not only get rid of all the trackers, but you can also get rid of all the ads as you go on the internet. So just a quick show of hands, how many in the room actually are, use an ad blocker or have heard of, about an ad blocker? Okay, not as high as I would have hoped for. But the number of users who are using ad blocker is exponentially increasing. So there was a recent estimate that more than 600 million people around the world now use an ad blocker when they browse the internet. Um, and there was a recent study done by Comscore which showed that more than around 20% of users in the US use an ad blocker. In other places, for example, in the EU, the percentage of users using ad blockers is much higher because they are in general more privacy conscious than us. So the online advertising industry sees these ad blocking and tracker blocking tools as a threat to their business model. So if you're not going to see any ads while using Google or Facebook, how are they going to make money off of you? So this really breaks their advertising ecosystem. Um, so what these companies have started to do, they have started to detect your ad blockers. So they now use these anti-ad blockers. So if you go to a website and you're using an ad blocker, they will figure that out and they will stop you. And they will ask you to disable your ad blockers so they can track you and they can show you advertising so they can make money off of you. So 
many popular publishers, for example, the Washington Post, Wired, Forbes, have recently started to use some of these techniques. And these attempts to undermine ad blockers can mean a return to the status quo, to widespread tracking. So we really need to develop effective and long-lasting countermeasures to make good ad blockers, which can protect your privacy. So in our lab, we are working on a stealthy ad blocker. So our lab and a bunch of other researchers around the world, we are trying to improve ad blockers. So we are specifically working on a stealthy ad blocker. So these ad blockers are anti-anti-ad blockers, right? So we are stepping up the game a little bit. And we are targeting the strategies using which these websites figure out that you have an ad blocker on. So we want to make sure you can choose to protect your privacy when you browse the internet. So I would like to conclude here um, with a big picture here. So, so the big picture really here is big data. And the key term here is data. So the internet is fueled by data, by advertising, which relies on this data which is collected on us. So the bigger question that we need to ask is, how can we sustainably maximize the contribution of big data to our economy, to our society, to individual lives? And right now, the order seems to be preferring prioritizing economy. And then we have society. And at the very end, we have individuals. And we really need to think hard about this. Is this the order we want? And we believe that this order should actually be changed. And it should be the individuals who should be put first in this system. So we are doing research to put users in control of their privacy. So you should be able to control what kind of information is collected uh, about you as you browse the internet. So please use an ad blocker. An ad blocker or a tracker blocker puts you in control. And you can choose when it is OK to leak some of your information. And you can decide not to leak that information. Um, so our research is aiming to develop more effective and more robust privacy enhancing tools. And just to conclude, I have a call of action. All of you who are not using an ad blocker, please use an ad blocker. Because if you use an ad blocker, then it actually reduces the marginal benefit for these companies. If, imagine if more than 70 80% of people start to use ad blockers, these companies have no choice but to change their course of action. And some of these things have recently started to happen. So we really need to show them that we as consumers have a voice and we are privacy conscious. So all of you who install an ad blocker, you're telling these companies that you are privacy conscious. And unless these companies change the way at least they're operating right now, they try to give you more control over what kind of information they're collecting on, of you, on you, you will not give up your information. You will not let these companies monetize your information. With that, I would thank all of you for coming today. Thank you. <laughs> Time for some questions. Showed a list of all private entities, Facebook and Google, et cetera, et cetera. And then you brought in the government. Are these all sources for the government to link in and get to know all uh, uh, information about you? Can the government actually penetrate these other entities? So I showed you two programs that the NSA had. The first program was that government was directly getting information from these companies. So it's not really actually hard for them. But even if these companies don't comply, the US government controls all the infrastructure. So the NSA and other spy agencies around the world, they can tap into internet cables and they can collect all the traffic off the wire. And all this traffic contains metadata like cookies and fingerprints. And using this information, they can figure out what everyone is doing. So NSA actually has a search engine, which is called X key score. It's like Google, but they can search, give me all the people in Germany who spoke Arabic and it would pop out all information, again, using information like cookies, which are considered metadata by the government. So the government really does not need to work with these companies to get this information. So the point is, as soon as your information leaks, in terms of cookies and fingerprints, as you browse the internet, companies can use this information, and then it's very easy for governments to get hand on this kind of information. Uh, what are your thoughts on net neutrality? So there is, at least in the next administration, there is no hope for net neutrality. Um, so there are a lot of um, steps which have already been taken to undermine net neutrality. For example, I was telling you that the new commissioner of the FCC, Ajit Pai, 
um, who is a very um, um, pro free market person, he recently actually has rolled back these privacy regulations. Now, not only internet companies like Google and Facebook, but your internet service providers like Comcast can actually collect all of the information about, a, about you and sell it to advertisers. So that's really against the essence of net neutrality. Unfortunately, most of us, for example, in Iowa City, Coralville area, don't really have a choice of internet service provider. So if Mediacom chooses to do so, I really don't have CenturyLink servicing my area. So this really undermines competition, gives users no choice, and as these net neutrality regulations are going to be rolled back, your information will be exposed to more players to make money off of you in the online advertising ecosystem. Is there any uh, hope uh, for dealing successfully uh, with uh, fake information, uh, namely fake news? Yes. So, so, so a lot of fake news websites which popped up, and there has been a lot of reporting, so I will not go into the detail of what they were doing, but many of these fake news websites, their incentive to actually spread fake news was to earn money. So hackers, there were hackers in Romania and Russia who were creating these fake websites, and they were putting ads on their websites. Now the key thing for them was to drive traffic to their websites. How can they get people clicking on their websites? So what they did was they, was they would create stories which would appeal very much to a particular segment of the society. And then they would spread this kind of information on Facebook and then some people would choose to believe it, unfortunately, and then start sharing it. And then millions of people would be reaching their websites and they would make thousands of dollars. So really, the thing I want to point out here is the core of fake news problem is actually also advertising to some extent. So if we can get rid of this widespread tracking and the incentive for profit in advertising, we can try to reduce that problem to some extent. But again, this is a very complex problem. I'll be happy to talk more with you on this. So, I mean, in kind of light of all the you know, blocking ads and whatnot, what role do you know, even VPNs or other sort of ways of masking data traffic, how do they play into kind of using that? So VPNs protect you from your internet service provider or any other entities which are between you and the website that you are trying to visit. So if you use a VPN, Mediacom cannot, even if they collect all of your traffic, they will be seeing encrypted traffic, they cannot monetize their traffic. So VPNs do provide a benefit. But then again, the website and all the trackers on those websites, they are still tracking you. VPNs don't stop that. So you need to use all of these tools together. Unfortunately, there is no single program that you can install and you can be safe. VPNs, and the thing that I'm trying to advertise today, at, um, ironically, ad blockers. I'm not advertising them, I'm trying to promote them. So please install an ad blocker and use VPNs. Use as many of these privacy enhancing tools you can to protect your privacy. University pays them. That's ironic. That's actually mind boggling. So all these websites, they voluntarily put these trackers on their websites. And the, let me give you a gist of why they actually would do that. So the promise here is, if Google's tracker is available, is on uiva.edu, then uiva.edu can actually pay Google to advertise to people on the internet and they can specifically target who are the people who came to uiwa.edu and were looking at different graduate programs? So this is obviously makes some sense for uiwa.edu, but the key problem here is when this information goes from uiwa.edu to Google, uiwa.edu does not have any control to take that information back, and Google is free to use all this information with information they are collecting on more than 80% of one top one million websites on the internet. If you install ad blocker or ghostry, they would actually show you a number. So as are they are blocking these tracker and ads, you will get a satisfaction and you will see these numbers going up. What prevents, I mean, there's a scat and all thing, cookies and fingerprints, and like you mentioned, VPNs. Why doesn't Google just put some code in their browser so they know where I'm going? Is there something that prevents them from doing that? That's an excellent question. And yes, if everyone was using Chrome, that would be the case. And there is a competition here between different browsers, and many of these browsers are now open source. 
So if Google does decide to put a tracker right in their web browser that everyone is using, then people will stop using that browser. And thankfully, we still have some options. So Mozilla Firefox is a browser which is by a non-profit entity, Mozilla Foundation, um, which is a very good alternative, even if you think Internet Explorer sucks. So social consumerism, that's a very loaded term. <laughs> so I'm trying to unravel what exactly do you mean by... Uh, <laughs> So I guess the key here is if users show intent and users show this, for example, by using an ad blocker to websites that you're not okay with tracking, these companies would try to adjust their business models. And this would change the status quo and hopefully the status quo will actually change for the good. And as companies realize they cannot do tracking, there are actually some new initiatives which have been going on which are non-intrusive advertising or advertising which actually does not rely on tracking and only on context. So there are some of these advertising exchanges which are coming up, but again, these ex exchanges would only be successful if more and more of us actually use an ad blocker and force companies to change their behavior. And hopefully, as a consumer, the only way for us to show intent to these companies is by showing that we care about our privacy. So there are many alternate models and people who are working in marketing and business, there's a lot of research on that already. So there is one interesting business model. This is a browser which is actually supported by the Mozilla Foundation. Um, it's called Clicks. They have an ad blocker built in. And one of the revenue models they are thinking about is as a consumer, you value your privacy. You're, let's say, okay with paying $5 a month for your web browsing and you want to ensure that no one tracks you. So this money will be stored in your web browser, and as you visit different websites, your web browser would actually pay proportionally to different websites what they kind of like um, deserve based on how much time you spent on these websites. So these kind of anonymous micropayments is one option that people are thinking about, and there could be other exciting new paradigms that can come up. So let's not stop ourselves from installing these ad blockers simply based on the fact that some people will say that you are going to break the internet. All these websites would go away and then there won't be any Facebook. Trust me, they will still be there. They will find other ways to monetize their services. They don't. Many of these um, government organizations, so there was a recent leak about the CIA. So governments have their own in-house hacking, surveillance operations. Um, governments probably, they collaborate with each other. So for example, the NSA strong, very, has a very good collaboration with um, spy agencies in the UK and some of the, the spy agencies in the Europe. So they do collaborate with each other. So if it is illegal for the US government to spy on their citizens, sometimes they would ask the US, UK counterpart to do it for them. And then they would later on exchange this information. It goes like multiple ways. So that's some collaboration which has been documented by journalists. But other than that, no. So they rely on black hat marketplaces, underground marketplaces where they secretly exchange tools and and security flaws in devices and internet systems. Okay, thank you all for your questions. And thank you so much, Dr. Sashi. Thank you. Thank you.